Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Health Exchange Data Management and Data Integration. Before we get started, I'd like to announce a few brief housekeeping details. Today's session is being recorded and an online archive of today's event will be available a few days after the call. You will receive an email from AHIP that will ask if you would like to receive the archive. Please respond if you would. I'd like to remind you of AHIP's antitrust statement and ask that you reference it in the Handouts tab. Please keep in mind that you may also ask a question at any time during the presentation by typing your question into the chat box located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and then click Send. You can adjust the size of the slides to fit your screen by clicking on the Scale button located in the upper right-hand side of your screen. We're very fortunate to have with us today Eugene Cyan and Craig LeClaire. Eugene Cyan has 20 years of experience and brings extensive expertise in business process management and content management. He has an extensive track record in leading companies to success. Prior to Sophion, Mr. Cyan successfully led the second generation imaging, document management, and workflow initiative for various content management companies. Mr. Cyan is recognized as an industry leader, frequently speaks at industry events, and has published several articles in the field of content management. He serves on the Stony Brook University Computer Science Advisory Board and is a member of the Board of Directors of Long Island High Technology Incubator, where he contributes to the growth of technology-based startup firms. He has a master's degree in computer science from New York Institute of Technology and an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering from Istanbul Technical University in Turkey. Craig LeClaire serves enterprise architecture professionals. He is an internationally recognized expert in business process management and initiated Forrester's series on untamed business processes, including customer onboarding, invoice management, medical health records, financial compliance, and customer communications management. He specializes in helping companies transform from manual and paper-based processes to the mobile and digital world as well as in information management, dynamic case management, enterprise content management, electronic signature, document imaging and capture, and document output for customer communications management. Craig is the leading analyst on the outsourcing of document processing services, including managed print services. At this time, I would like to turn the floor over to Eugene. Good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Eugene San from Safian. Uh, we are delighted to be here with you today. I'm also joined by my colleague, Craig LeClaire from Forrester Research. Uh, today's topic is going to be the health insurance exchanges, uh, particularly the data uh, management and process integrations um, as the public and private exchange, as the new era being viewed as within the healthcare payer organizations or in general healthcare delivery systems. Uh, we hope that you'll find the, the session engaging, uh, and uh, we will be taking some calls, uh, questions towards the end of the presentations, but uh, please do forward your comments and questions throughout the sessions, and we'll have an ample time towards the end to review your uh, your particular interests of an area. Um, I'm going to turn over to uh, my colleague Craig to uh, take on the lead about the perhaps an overall state of the, the industry, so to speak, and pre and post reform. And uh, we'll then deep dive into some of the technical aspects of health insurance exchange process and data integration techniques. Craig? Yeah, thank you, Eugene. This is a, a great opportunity uh, to speak to everyone about this very important, exciting area. Um, and there's a fair amount of uh, content here, so I'm going to uh, uh, hopefully be crisp in, in trying to explain it uh, to you. Um, so this this is an interesting um, set of, of data, pre-reform, um, post-affordable care act, and just, just in terms of the number of, um, uh, you know, uh, insurance coming onto the system and how this is uh, really uh, – Dramatic. I think we all know this. Uh, the, the interesting thing about um, this this data is actually um, the number um, that are will actually go to private exchanges. Um, um, that will, um, you know, is, is a number that's really really unknown at this point. You obviously see um, the, a large group coming on. Um, in uh, you know in in the exchanges in in, in 2014 you know projected, uh, but there's there's uh, it's unclear how many employee plans will shift their 
uh, employees onto the private exchanges. So actually, the number is is not really well known. Um, you know, it could be another five to seven to ten million that might actually come through the exchanges. So uh, it's it's big. Um, so I can go to the next slide here, Eugene. Um, you know these uh, you know mandates um are really um, uh, you know affecting the psychology of uh payers that we talk to and of course being Forrester research we get to talk to you know lots of insurance um uh, payer uh, you know companies and and kind of get their attitude and do various surveys into that population um and there is a strong uh, element of of fear um uh, around consolidation and you see this you see this consolidation happening you see that it's almost to the point where um, if you're uh, that the health payers, you know, if you're not uh, a, a very uh, large one, a strong one with lots of members, that you're actually going to merge with, um, you know, with with the provider area, with you know, with an, an accountable care organization, um, so that you're going to see, um, you know, kind of almost a cartelization of of medical combining provider and payer over time. That's like a five to ten year vision that uh, some at Forrester believe. Uh, but the bottom line is that um, the uh, the mandates from um, uh, you know reform is is the most disruptive ever, uh, and and it's it's really creating a lot of anxiety in the payer community. Um, you know, 40% of the portfolio mix in 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 one payer, um, you know, is is really dictated by federal, state, and and uh, local uh, regulations that they have to deal with. So, you know, what you're seeing is just a um, you know a lot on their plate. Uh, we can go to the next slide, Eugene. And independent of that, you have um, trends in digital disruption, which I'll talk briefly about, but uh, in um, technology, really consumer technology is is driving a new level of expectation uh, in customers, a new level of empowerment when you combine that with access to social data and peer review data. Um, it's it's very, very transformational. It's an infrastructure change. It's not quite the internet, not quite the railroad, but it's mobility is an infrastructure change. If you just look at these U.S. numbers, which of course is the context for um, the discussion today, 126 million tablets um, in use by 2016. Uh, quarter billion smartphones. Um, this is very, very uh, transformative. We believe that in aggregate, uh, companies will be investing about $55.7 billion in re-engineering their fundamental business processes to deal with the changes in mobility, the higher customer expectations, and everything else. Uh, next slide. Um, and as a result, there's um, a different perspective that companies, that, that the leading companies will have. Um, you know, systems of engagement versus systems of records. And if you think of the payer uh, community, they've largely been a uh, information management, um, you know, entity. They've been managing systems of records for, you know, managing claims and managing accounts uh, for the insured. And the shift that they need to make is to think more in terms of of, an, of, an, of engagement um, and and touching people. And particularly as you move. Uh, for the first slide from more of this um, B2B approach, which of course is more based on the in, in, in employer-sponsored plans, to private exchanges that are going to be reaching out to 30, 40 million uh, new entrants, um, it's going to be more about systems of engagement. So this is a major mind share, uh, shift for um, you know a, a lot of payers, and, and we see that as we discuss with them um, you know, various options. We can go to the next slide. Um, you know, customer experience. Uh, you hear a lot about that uh, today. Certainly, Forrester is, uh, you know, one of many that that talk about a new level of customer experience. And again, we think that's driven by um, the empowered um, consumer, driven by consumer technology, dr driven by mobile and social, and these types of trends. Um, so every year we go out and we, uh, uh, you know, test uh, the brands, um, you know, uh, and, you know, across major industries, you know, that you see here, and just get a sense from the people, um, you know, what what you know it, is this brand in this area providing a strong customer experience or not? So you see the range here from, um, uh, you know, for retailers from 75 to 90, with the mean being right, uh, you know, around 80. Uh, and there are two kind of interesting things about, uh, you know, about this. You know, one is that the the range for providing strong customer experience um, is pretty wide. So you have, um, you know, in hotels, 
you have 60, uh, a poor 83. That's a wide range. So some companies are, are doing much better in providing customer experience you know, than another. And the second thing you notice is that, and these are the top companies in terms of customer experience, is that the average tends to be below good. So there's a lot of um, um, headroom to improve customer experience across the board. Let's go to the next slide. I just want to show you where uh, health payers are. Um, and unfortunately, uh, they are on the very bottom of this chart. They are providing a customer experience in ter uh, you know, ranging from very poor to poor, uh, and that is the lowest in terms of the major industries that we that we track. So um, all of that's going to have to uh, change as we move to this more competitive structure, this more B2P, uh, B2C environment, um, um, you know, over the next uh, 10 years. Uh, so we would expect that the incentive to provide a stronger customer experience will really be pervasive in health insurance. Let's go to the next slide. And this is a, a you know a, a a chart that really talks about a new um, era that we're in, where you have a new forms of digital disruption that come out of nowhere. You have companies like a Groupon starting with eight thousand dollar investment that can come in, you know, and disrupt. Um, you know, a major, you know, uh, set of companies in the industry. So it used to be in the old disruption, you know, it took, um, you know, there were, there were very few, you know, innovators. Think of, you know, um, you know, a Boeing introducing the commercial jet 30 years ago uh, or IBM introducing the mainframe, uh, you know, 30 years ago. They had to bet a lot of capital on that. So they had to make huge investments. Um, there were a small number of innovators. Uh, and they delivered, you know, relatively small power. But think about today, where the university down the street from you is graduating another thousand, um, you know, smart, uh, technically literate, um, you know, you know, um, boys and girls that will just love to tear down your company. So you have an environment where the there are thousands of more, in, you know, innovators. Um, it's it's the the, the costs of innovation have, have really gone down. You don't have to bet the full company on it the way you did in the IBM and the Boeing case, um, and and the power on your uh, you know tablet is is the equivalent of a supercomputer in the mid 90s. So you have um, you know just a tremendous um, you know leveling of the playing field. So companies in every industry and health payment is no different have to be very, very concerned about what uh, Forrester is calling digital disruption. Eugene, let's go to the next uh, slide. Um, so what are the technology investments required to um, offset this, uh, you know, these types of, you know, you know, you know tendencies? Um, you know, there's, there's uh, a move towards getting much more, much stronger data management. So master data management, uh, combining clinical and administrative data, you know, being able to use outside sources of data or big data, you know, meaning data from uh, the social world, data that is really can, can tell you about the behavior of people and help with your care management, help with your, you know, provisioning of services to them. Um, so there's a lot of investment. The number one investment area across all today is really analytics. And that's in uh, you know big data, data warehousing, business intelligence, predictive analytics in particular will be key investment areas for payers over the next 10 years. A lot of that helping to move from batch to real-time data, and we think that business process management and case management in particular, you know, will support uh, more of this data and analytics focus. So it's again to get to that system of engagement that's required, you need a strong process layer and you need strong process thinking. Uh, the, the ability to think in terms of process, the kind of skills to transform processes. So this is business process management, BPM, the discipline is is, is sorely lacking in 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 the payer space. Um, you know, I know some payers that have hired, you know, business process groups, um, business analysts out of uh, major banks to really augment um, their ability to understand the discipline of having to transform processes. A lot of that is, you know, uh, you know is, is not there today on the payer side and absolutely required to deal with everything that's going on. Next slide, please. And so this is just a, um, making it more concrete, you have these exchanges um, that, that, that are coming up. Um, you know, you have um, all the core systems on the right of the slide that the payers, um, you know, have. These are the ones that will be uh, the most affected uh, by all of the changes going on. And essentially, if you look at these exchanges, um, in, in the ultimate uh, uh, development, 
you know, they might look kind of like an Expedia or an Orbit, you know, they're an, an Orbit, excuse me, uh, where they're they're you know aggregating data, they're doing comparisons, they're providing you know paths of uh, um, you know of opportunity for those coming onto the system. Um, there, there's got to be a real-time data exchange and update. It's all about aggregation of, of data. So if you look at the small bullets here, just about every one of these, then the, and these are right out of the you know the mandate, um, you know require uh, either new information to be uh, gathered you know by the payer, or existing information to be um, uh, re, you know repackaged, repositioned, and submitted to the exchange. You know whether it's um, you know um, you know supporting a rating system. Um, whether it's um, you know procedures to allow you know brokers to enroll individuals in qualified health plans, um, you know these are all require a transfer of data from one entity to another, and that's really uh, you know a huge challenge of 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 the um, you know exchanges. Uh, so one of the areas that I think is is going to be particularly critical over time is care coordination or case management, uh, because that's going to be you know particularly if we look at this um, you know these mergers of provider and payer that are somewhat inevitable, we're seeing it already, um, one of the advantages of doing that is that you can get a more holistic insight and context into the overall care, and not just the cost, but the quality of the care as well. And that's where analytics will really help with that. Um, and the process uh, capability to be able to do real care management, to move the production worker today that might be at that payer into more of a uh, you know more more ownership of the um, you know of the outcome versus just being someone who's assigned work, uh, and that takes the kind of technology support to provide the insight and give the ability to um, uh, to allow more flexible control to that individual. So it's really moving from uh, more production worker to more of a knowledge worker. And there's needed, there's process support and process work needed there. But fundamentally, um, there's going to need to be kind of intermediaries and real-time data exchange, uh, you know, for the exchanges. That's going to be the big problem that the health payers have is exposing the right data in order to qualify for all these bullets that are there. Eugene, next slide, please. Um, and so this gives you an idea of, of what it might look like, you know, in uh, you know in in leveraging predictive analytics, you know, mobility sensor data to really provide uh, kind of a next best action, you know, for exchange interaction. So uh, this is very much an aspirational uh, type diagram, but it's one that you know we we see um, you know companies inevitably you know moving to. Certainly the historic. Uh, perspective from systems of records, um, you know, is still uh, critical, um, and, and certainly outside data, um, public as a service capabilities, but it's really the ability, the ability to reach into all these areas, pull out the information that's needed from social, uh, from smart products, uh, health data, usage information, you know, and really, and really use that analytics engine to figure out the optimized set of choices, uh, data-driven offers, uh, customer buying trends, and, and really create that context-rich experience. That's really where um, the technology push uh, over time, you know, needs to go, you know, for the payment community. I will take the next slide, please. You know, and there's also um, a lot of uh, trending towards um, deploying processes, deploying new solutions, you know, in the cloud. And we're seeing that. You know, we're seeing a, uh, you know, this is essentially a timeline showing the uh, decline in investment in systems of records and core systems and the increase of investments in more of these systems of engagement that we're talking about. So um, technologies like collaboration um, and business rules and business process management and case management, the uh, investment uh, forecast and profile for that is, is at the 48% level, um, very high. Uh, as opposed to the um, investment in 76 plan for no new investment in ERP CRM in the next 12 months, so there's a there there you know we're starting to see because of the pressure of that consumer technology, we're starting to see um, a lot of the businesses uh, move to deployment um, with more rapid solutions in the cloud, and I think for a lot of the payer problems here, um, looking to uh, intelligently source. 
the solutions that make sense as more holistic solutions you know from the cloud is certainly something that has to be on the list of things to do i don't see how you can get to where you need to be um, by doing a lot internally now compliance mandates um, you know are are really really critical um, you know bpm adoption for healthcare in the public sector um, this is very, very important. Um, looking at optimization of processes and you know, support for compliance efforts are number one and two on the list. I think we can go to the next slide, Eugene. Uh, and I think that was my last slide. Um, so uh, I've taken uh, a few of your minutes, so I really appreciate the time, and I'm going to turn it over to Eugene to go into some depth on some of these issues. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Craig. And I truly appreciate it again for the audience. Um, so a little bit about Sophion. I think that everybody on the phone probably perhaps knows uh, Forrester Research quite well. Um, the Sophion, we are a, a technology-oriented company uh, to the point that, uh, that the Craig earlier made the, uh, some few examples about the quote-unquote disruptive forces, and we believe we, we have been providing some of those disruptive forces. Uh, we are a relatively small think tank organization with significant emphasis on our, our high-end technology, and Softion has been in the epicenter of uh, cloud computing, real-time analytics, and big data and predictive modeling. And uh, our focus is, uh, for the last several years has been in the healthcare space. So uh, one little known secret about perhaps maybe a, a best-kept secret, um, Sophion had the privilege of working uh, or delivering critical components of what everybody calls it these days, the uh, Massachusetts Connector, the exchange, which then became a model for the, the, the PPAC, a significant portion about that. A uh, little bit about background up there, uh, the exchange platform that currently operates, it's truly, it meets every almost significant portion of the ACA. Um, and Sophion technology was used in the areas of business process management and a CRM platforms, uh, as well as augmenting the premium billing technologies provided by other vendor technologies as well. Uh, let's talk about a little bit about the in overall scope of it. Um, as you know quite well, there are basically there are three different flavors of exchanges that are being mandated as part of the ACA. Um, the icons that are shown or states that are shown in blue uh, indicating that these are the state-based exchanges. Um, they have made a determination that they are in the process of either implementing, augmenting their existing exchanges, or uh, they are in the process of building a, a from ground up exchanges. Um, and then the, uh, there's a hybrid state, as a lighter blue, what we call it a state partnership exchanges. And if you're in those states, um, the respective state uh, roles and responsibilities may vary from uh, the initial, the QHP certification process and rate, rate review processes. But in essence, that significant portion of the exchange, the infrastructures and day-to-day -day operations will be then provided through the federally facilitated exchange. And for the payers in those states, basically, uh, then, therefore, the products will be enlisted in the, quote-unquote, in the federal exchange space. The consumer will be able to shop. The premium billing aspect of the exchange operation will be lied on the shoulders of the payer organizations, as well as the most likely the broker operations. And what we are basically hearing that there is going to be an announcement, if not already, that the uh, FFE uh, will not have a broker portal which means that the brokers will continue to be engaged directly by the carriers if you are, happen to be in one of those uh, FFE states. On the SB states, uh, we are seeing a significant portion of them uh, basically certifying, well certified brokers uh, to at the exchange level. So in other words, the brokers will be certified to sell any one of the QHP products on the exchanges which is a major shift. This will speak to, obviously, uh, uh, Craig's point about that, in an unknown and unforeseen, which we expect, by the way, the numbers could be a lot higher than even 5, 10 million. It could be up for uh, maybe you know, 20 million. Kaiser predicts about 10 million small group commuter rate uh, commercial coverage are being dropped off and move into the, uh, the public exchanges, especially for the small businesses that they currently employ a lot of uh, minimum wage or part-time employees, those type of coverages will be expected to fill, or fill in by the state exchanges. 
So let's talk about that really what will it take for a carrier to interface or, or participate successfully with a given state exchange. So you can see here these are very some of the very high level uh, you know touch points or the data integrations or process integrations. Critically um, there are four major functionality or, or, or business operations that either at the state level or at the federal level the exchanges will bring or will mandate for carriers. One will be obviously the, the plan management or plan catalog management. There are many uh, exchanges at the state level as well as at the federal level. Not only that will require you to certify your QHPs, but also once the exchange becomes operational, there is going to be a real-time rating aspect to it. Now, granted that we're not talking about significant rating processes altogether because QHPs, by definition, they are the guaranteed issue. But there is going to be a requirement for carriers to provide real time, as in the case of Massachusetts. Also, at the FFB level, that the, the plans must be able to provide some rating engine uh, through interfaces such as XML, web services, or SOAP to be specific. The second group of interfaces will be around enrollment and eligibility. Um, that also includes uh, maybe a portion of the individual's uh, APTC and CSR calculations. As you know quite well on the FFB side, the Federal Data Hub, that will be a functionality built embedded into it. There is also, at this point, again, I'm wearing a little bit of my, uh, you know, reading the tea leaves. We expect that if the broker portal is not going to be part of the FFB, um, that we expect that APTC CSR calculations to be exposed under a certain you know, rules and regulations to the carrier who will then be able to build a quote unquote broker portal for their exchange products. And this obviously, you know, we can spend hours talk about the no wrong door policy, how the payers can actually build their quote unquote private exchanges. Well, really no distinction between the private and payer, uh, public at that point. It will be an exchange, and then the individual can pick and choose between the QHP subsidized products versus a fully commercial uh, premium paying products. But having said that, that's going to be the second component. Clearly, the, the premium billing is the most uh, important aspect to it. Um, we have been you know, engaged with several um, organizations helping them with some of the initial efforts to, once again, on the FFE side, premium billing functionality. If you're in one of those states, it, it, it is a, a, a insurer's role or responsibility. So insurers have to create the premium billing platform, which will then calculate the, both the APTC, CSR, the tax credit, and cost sharing, and then being able to aggregate that, that, that invoicing information, uh, matching the collecting the payments from the respective uh, federal level, as well as in state like Massachusetts, there is a, an, an above and beyond. There is a, a state subsidy, what's called a RAP programs, and then obviously the, the individuals will be responsible portion of their own quote unquote the premium billings. And then the obviously consumer interaction, the customer service, the CRM, it becomes a critical component of overall exchange functionality. Once again, these are the initial requirements 2014 to the Craig's point. We believe that this is this value proposition, the level of touch points will be continually pushed along the way or the, the continuity of care. Uh, we are hearing similar engagement for, again, providers are becoming an insurance company, creating their own package plans and whatnot, and they, by moving rapidly into the ACO space. Uh, as well as the payers creating uh, capabilities around kind of providing services to individuals um, in the medical homes and whatnot. Obviously, you're part of those, you know, the news every day that comes out about the that, 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 that those lines between payer and provider is being kind of blurred out and soon will disappear. In that context, um, the, the data exchanges or process integration in the cloud, what we call it, it will, it will gain significant momentum. So if you are a single payer, you can see the, the amount of touch points with the quote unquote external entities. Now historically, payer operation always behind what we call that are behind firewalls, behind the four walls. At most, 
you handle maybe 834s coming from some large uh, enrollment or large group in, in enrollment type of, uh, you know, the general agencies and whatnot. And probably the most predominant one was the 837. You receive your claims through some third-party administrations and whatnot or provider facilities. And all that information comes back to you in a, in a daily fashion under batch mode. Um, that will continue, except now you're going to be receiving 834s on a daily basis from exchanges. You're going to be receiving 820s, premium billing, reconciliation, remittance. And guess what happens if you happen to be in one of those uh, health plans that happens to have an operation in just two states? Just think about the possible integration points now you have to maintain between those two disparate, disparate uh, the state exchanges. And by the way, just like Medicaid, I'm sure some of you have been in that business for long enough. Um, if you've seen one state Medicaid implementations, you've seen one state Medicaid implementations. And in, and this rule will apply to the exchanges. Uh, the technology that is being used and deployed by the various states um, between what's being done in New York versus what's being done in Maryland versus in Massachusetts or in California. Um, we're talking about somewhat of a significantly different type of technology, possibly different kind of policies and procedures that are being implemented. And this is going to be a significant challenge. And this is only obviously we're talking about the public exchanges. Imagine what will happen with the private exchanges as your organization perhaps looking to implement their own exchange or looking to market their product on a more commercial, um, you know, the platforms like Mercer's or Aeon's or eHealthInsurance.com, these interfaces will proliferate to the point of unmanageability. We believe the solution to this problem is what we call the exchange connector. And the role of an exchange connector, that like the ones that provided by Sophion, is really that provides an intermediary or an isolation. And the best way that I can describe this platform Imagine, uh, not that many people perhaps know about it, but there is a system called Sabre uh, that actually facilitates and coordinates the uh, airline's uh, availability, seat assignments, pricing points, and whatnot with the quote-unquote consumer exchanges, and those being the Travelocities or Orbits or Expedias of the world. We view them in a similar fashion altogether. So the exchange connector, role of the exchange connector, is your gateway, is your connectivity to the rest of the world. Uh, what it really does at the main premise here is that your internal processes remain internal to you. The investments that you made in those uh, administrative systems that you spend literally you know, years upon years and upwards of some organizations that I know that have spent uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in tweaking those enrollment underwriting solutions or claim solution or in customer service. In this world, those systems could continue to function and, and remain intact to a significant, significant um, leverage point. Uh, what's really happening is your external world is being handled by the exchange connector as being shown in here. Um, the, the some of the functionalities, as you can see here, is that the uh, if you come back from the once again to your left, the payer organizations, you're seeing that those critical function areas that are being again a critical part of your current um, administrative um, processes, um, and the and all the way to the right, you're you're basically seeing the critical aspect of an exchange operation let it be a, a state-based or partnership-based or even FFE. And to be frank with you, many of those components will also apply to the private exchanges, perhaps with the exception of things like MAGI-based uh, eligibility enrollment process or uh, the definition of uh, navigators and, and, and whatnot. Obviously, these are unique to uh, public exchanges as well as the, the product plan certification process. And but you can see here the role of the exchange connector is the kind of taking your existing systems, generating the necessary document, and exposing to the the world, exposing to your exchange channels or trading partners, both in the batch mode also in real time. As we all know, I think that the payer organization has been quite ready. You know, they have been somewhat uh, to the extent that I will say with the 50-10, the 40-10 to 50-10, has already put you on the on the right trajectory in terms of handling, you know, 
uh, X12 EDI transactions, but significant portion of exchanges today uh, is still going to be a batch based, more so on a daily batch processing, uh, like 834s coming from various states. And what we are seeing, however, that there are companion guides that are being published. In other words, your your typical, um, you know, the 834, 220 implementation will not be sufficient, um, and there will be a state base, a uniqueness, and the new data elements that are going to be passed on to. For instance, that 834 coming from a state exchange may or may not have the PCP information available because that is not a requirement uh, with an ACA. So you need to be able to normalize the data, kind of almost the same concept that right? some of the carriers already did, what we call it a step up, step down, right? So you are able to take a fairly complex maybe EDI schema, not necessarily in the format that your backend system is able to handle. Through this translation, through this step down process, you can normalize the data to an acceptable and you can basically stage that, that, uh, that, that delta values perhaps in an exchange repository. And, and by doing so, you are leveraging to a great extent all, all your investment. Uh, you know, I've seen so many, so many um, analogies that are being made, but perhaps the best one is about the, this movement towards with the January 1st deadline looming on us. In fact, I should say October 1st, even September 1st, perhaps, depending upon your state's implementation of their exchange, is, is kind of changing a flat tire while you're driving 40 miles an hour. Really, that is the best way that I can describe, and I think truly reflects that. So there's going to be many, many moving parts while you're in the midst of running your business like you have been for the many, many years. So how do we move forward from where we are? Um, the best way that we think that um, there is a significant amount of content is being published, in fact, when the, when the Feds uh, initially announced that the state exchanges and what they wanted to do, one of the things, in fact, uh, they've established some ground rules for states to follow. This goes back into their in a certification process. One of them is called the basic the standard and seven conditions. Um, and the, one of the first standards is what's called a MITA standards or MITA condition is that this stands for Medicaid Information Technology Architecture 3.0. And if you had any chance, uh, we'll be more than happy to include those references in the, in the publications that we're going to provide. Um, the MITA 3.0 specifically talks about separation and isolation of technology so that the, the, the ability to adapt to ongoing changes. One thing that's going to be sure and certain that everybody knows, I'm sure you are all aware, the, the, the notion of the requirement changes. Uh, it is, this is just the beginning, uh, folks. We do know that there are already been a conversation around, for instance, public exchanges being open to the other type of products. For instance, Connecticut already made an announcement. They will allow a, a non-ACA compliant plan to be enlisted on their state exchanges so that they, they want to be able to track the membership count coming through the state exchanges. Uh, so they can be sustainable, to be frank with you. They will like to be able to charge you those administrative fees so that they can continue to, uh, to, to basically operate and prosper. So in that context, we're already hearing that there will be vision coverage and dentals already, and, and, and again, as you know, that uh, some of the state exchanges already covering as a bundle plans or some of them is the dental only. So basically, the MITA 3.0, it says, look, everything has to be in a very versatile, very, very flexible way. So as you can see in here, in this model, uh, basically, the, the first building block of the MITA is that this SAW capability is, it stands for Service Oriented Architecture. And, and what we, what's enlisted in here falls into those four critical areas that I mentioned about the exchange operations that you need to build, is you need to build a SOA layer around your existing, existing investment. Again, we put an Amesis up there. Obviously, that falls in QNX there, uh, Trizor of Facets. Um, these are the existing system. What you see on the right-hand side is your, quote-unquote, the structure uh, administrative systems. But we also know that you are a big user of unstructured content. Excel documentations and, you know, the words as well as uh, anything in your email that you use as part of a critical business processes. Um, those, uh, those components also have to be surfaced uh, as a consumable 
service uh, interfaces, which normally really falls into the becoming the, the de facto standard is now SOAP, stands for Simple Object Access Protocol. It can be invoked as a natively TCP IP over HTTP protocols, and um, the federal data exchange, including the significant portion of the federal data hub, uh, the services will be exposed through the SOAP, SOA uh, interfaces. And I don't want to go into the great details, but uh, just the high-level plan management. Uh, you need to build a plan interfaces for rating engine, including that will require to calculate electronic calculators and things like calculating the person's, uh, you know, the CSRs and tax credits and whatnot. How does it apply to it? Which will be a critical part of the plan selection process for the customer will be shopping on the exchanges. In the enrollment side, the initial eligibility, enrollment, disenrollment, and changes, address change, plan change. Uh, in the future world of exchanges, if you are in an active purchaser state-based exchange, like Massachusetts or in California and the other ones, uh, that the states will be divided into multiple regions. And if you are happen to a consumer moving from one city to another city, uh, you may end up dropping your coverage from one carrier on the exchange from one QHP and being able to move to a separate QHP. So these are very complex processes at the end of the day. It's no longer a just simple address change. Obviously shop, we can talk hours about it, but it looks like the latest news that we got from the feds, they're going to defer employee choice portion of the shop. But then again, multiple state-based exchanges, they already made a commitment that the shop is going to be a critical part of their operation day one. Uh, financial management. Um, we are not aware of many carriers today who has a robust premium billing solution who can handle the very significant uh, the needs or demands of, uh, of uh, ACA or public exchanges. Um, as you know, on the private exchange side also, the notion of a defined contributions and so on and so forth. So there are many, many elements that you really have to be ready for it. Um, and for those organizations that are not able to do that, uh, the element of premium billing solutions like the ones that Softion be able to provide to the carriers, this is a value that we bring and we expose those services again through the SOA layer. Uh, broker management, I think we talked significantly about that, but the critical component will be that uh, broker registration process to begin with, whether they are certified or not. Uh, and upon the enrollment process, we'll talk about how does the commissions will be calculated. Uh, for instance, there are some states, once again, um, the brokers will be working for the state, like California. Um, and uh, in, those, uh, in those states that the the brokers ultimately, the compensation and everything in between will be then managed by the by the exchange itself. However, in those conditions, that broker could be very well, you know, um, as as, as um, in a, in an FFE state, perhaps it might be working for you. Now they are going to be selling QHP products. So how do you calculate commissions and how do you apply that towards the MLRs and whatnot? Um, customer service. It's not in a lot of people's um, kind of to-do list at this point because everybody is nowadays focusing on the getting their plan definitions and QHP certified, but it's going to be it's known fact. It's going to be a critical component, especially especially as it relates to the the cost aspect or MLR aspect of the QHP products. How we are servicing them? What is the utilization? What's the prior authorization rate? Uh, similar to what we believe, similar to uh, CMS star rating. Uh, perhaps not within a year or two, year or two, but subsequently we view that exchange plans will also be ranked and and and, and rated based on the members' uh, uh, customer um, uh, what I call it a satisfaction rate. So it's a critical component again, yet it's not known. Campaign management, however, is a very critical component. Um, I think California already made an announcement that. They're going to be paying Navigator up to $50 per new enrollees and $25 per renewals. That's per in, per new um, in new members to the exchange. Um, there's significant amount of commitment and, and, and plans being made. So this is the SOA layer. The next layer, what we call the Enterprise Service Bus layer. This is again per MIDA specifications. If you haven't uh, deployed or uh, tapped your toes into the waters of the ESPs, I will strongly urge you to consider that. 
And the best way to describe is the ESPs is what we call it our composite services. You know, look at the SOA services is a kind of a, a very rudimentary, very primitive, um, whereas the enterprise service bus, it really kind of handles that very complex task. And the best way that I can, not to trivialize it, but to some of those of you, uh, as you know, I will say not so on the perhaps on the IT end of the exchange challenge, uh, the best way to describe ESP is imagine there is a service within the ESP that says, bake me a cake. And ESP will then understand that, bake me a cake, into uh, get me flour, get me sugar, get me eggs, and, and it will do all that process all together. So in essence, that it will handle the transaction coordinations and orchestrations. It is also the ESP's role to interface with the third-party components like uh, state hubs, for instance, that we expect not for us within the first year, but movement towards in the just like in today. You know, Expedia doesn't talk to American Airlines uh, by sending a daily feed of the seats that are sold. Imagine you have to wait three days before you get a confirmation about that you are being quote unquote booked your seats. Do you think that Expedia will be as successful? Uh, I think the clear answer will be no. So the movement, this is the movement towards this, the consumerization or, or consumer being the center of it, it's going to require a lot of real-time connectivity between the, all the parties, all the way from the feds to the carriers to the brokers. So the integration service is a critical part of the ESP platforms. Again, look into the products like um, Oracle and IBM, uh, by all means, and as well as like the Softion delivers. Um, the composite services, you can see the QHP shop experiences financial management. And there's going to be a lot of utilities that's going to be needed. Uh, data will come in. If you are a multi-state plans, you may get a 834 with a four different companion guide from a four different state exchange. You need to be able to understand the nuances and try to find the differences about those 834s, and you need to be able to normalize it. Same thing on an XML real-time gateways. Uh, like the rating engines, as we move forward, we are talking about possibly a real-time enrollment at the group level. Uh, because as you know, the groups initially will be provided also, group enrollment will be done under 834, which does not really fit into the quote-unquote the, 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 the business model that's being exchanged is being proposing. And obviously common interfaces, the notification interfaces, and the massive data management. We believe there's going to be a significant churning between the uh, Medicaid and, and, and exchanges and, and possibly even a commercial. So how are you going to keep track of these individuals as they move from one plan to my product to another product? The master data management is, is, a, is, is one of the holy grails that now we're seeing a lot of carriers are considering to implement and to for the purpose of keeping track of these individuals because the no wrong door possibility means that carry or the consumer may come to your organization in any one of those doors and you need to be able to maintain a, some level of um, knowledge about that particular individual so that the you can do some effective commercial underwriting process um, if you realize that a, a, a consumer may be, uh, may be subject to that kind of a, a, a process. The next tier in the process is called a BPM. It's really a business process modeling. In what we are talking about, the processes that are identified in here, these are the heavily regulated business processes verbatim uh, identify either at the FFE level or at the state's level. Uh, we strongly urge carriers to really start to, you know, gear up your you know, Six Sigma initiatives that you have started many years ago uh, towards the lean studies about the cost or, or cost containment or process improvement. BPM is now at the epicenter of ACA. And not only is the BPM the way it's been done, but now the, the BPMs for health exchanges has to be, uh, quote unquote, what we call it as a cloud BPM solution. Because your processes has to go across the internet, across the firewalls, to the other partners, let it be state entities, state exchanges, or the federal exchanges, or possibly in a federal, what we call it, FFE broker API, if the feds ultimately make a decision that carriers are responsible for building the broker portals. So how does a broker will enroll an individual at your website uh, where the APTCCSR and eligibility calculation will be done at the federal data hub? Uh, BPM is critical. Uh, individual enrollment, you can see, uh, once they are enrolled, 
how are you going to be able to, you know, accommodate their payment methods? Um, electronic bill payment presentment, uh, credit card processing, PayPal processing, these are all critical business processes and they all have a distinct uh, kind of process management, process orchestration uh, effort around that. Shop enrollment, obviously, and the broker uh, operations, once again, there are distinct VPMs that, um, you know, to be frank with the latest count that we have internally is nearly 75 distinct business processes. Just think about that, for instance, as someone going through mid-year, uh, their eligibility status changes because of now their income has changed. Um, they may be having a reduce or might be subject to uh, maybe a different type of QHPs than what they have done initially. And these VPMs has to be uh, very much in, in near real time, if not real time. It has to be capable of interfacing with a lot of the third party components that no longer will be, everything will be running within the carrier's data center. Many of these processes will have a need or dependency of product and services that are provided, quote unquote, on the cloud, which then takes us to the next level. The presentation aspect to it, one of the critical components of the MITA 3.0 what we call the user experience. So the user experience, uh, even as, as Craig pointed out, there's a major push towards the mobile computing. So the mobile interfaces will basically adhere to the same business processes, whether the individual enrolling through their iPhone or, or iPad, it will have the same exact kind of enrollment process will follow whether they're coming through the portal or they might be coming through making a phone calls or even possibly even walk-ins like the case that we have up in Massachusetts, that we have individuals that really don't have access to computers. And folks, if you consider the demographics of type of people who will be buying product on the exchange, you have to build those processes. And you have to create a consistency. You cannot just do a peer-to-peer -peer communication. So this talks about the uh, quote-unquote exchange connector being a MITRE 3 dollar compliant platforms. So the actors that we're going to have, the people are going to be using the system, as you can see, the members, the employers, as well as the brokers and navigators. Obviously, we are referring to the external consumers or actors. Um, and so from an implementation point of view, what we are seeing is that basically there is a great opportunity for to be able to, uh, you know, pushing the ESB, BPM, and UX platform to the cloud that can be by the trusted partners of the carriers can accomplish that. To a certain extent, this has already been done. You know, there are many examples. Companies like Amdion doing the data claims aggregation coming from the providers, and they aggregate the data and they then provide the data to the carriers. Um, so we believe this is the this is an this is an exciting time for for carrier to truly embrace it. And again, not to mention, Federal Data Hub is a cloud-based implementation, um, and basically that through the security uh, as the same way the security is implemented among the financial services sectors or property life or casualty, all that information is consumers are free to enter their SSNs and last name, first name to go shop for a car insurance. So security aspects is already technology is already been there. It's a matter of basically taking the early phase or early phase of innovation. So you can see here this describes that also the quote unquote the multi-tenancy capability of such cloud technologies. Like the ones that are provided by Softion is that multi-tenant uh, UX and BPM and ESP. Now multi-tenancy doesn't mean that your data is basically is on the same hardware, same database. Multi-tenancy could be on a same platform, very much like a salesforce.com experience. Um, it could be mandated to have its own database on servers, but it could be also leverage based. So I think you're gonna see uh, very, very creative ways to they would fully comply or HIPAA compliance about being able to bring the carriers up and running, quote unquote, making them exchange ready using a creative, innovative ways to deploy this cloud technologies. And then the insurers has to really have that their backend system. Again, one carrier could have an Amesis and the other one could be QNX and facets. The interfaces, the SO interfaces being provided in this platform, it's interchangeable in essence that will make that carrier kind of plug in their backend. And folks, these are not just basically prototypes or ideas or concepts. Um, I must confess that you know our company has been working with multiple payers to the exact same thing that we are we are basically um, sharing this to with you today. Um, 
this is a very complex diagram, obviously. We can talk in great details. Um, we have multiple references in here. But if, in essence, what really breaks down to the data interfaces and exchanges or process integrations into the three different categories, all the way to the left, which you've seen as a federal data hub or elements of FFE, which you will have the, uh, the things like, uh, for instance, the initial um, the enrollment eligibility, PTCCSR calculation will be always done by the federal data hub, no matter what exchange mode you're in, is FFE, SP, or, SB, or, or, or a state based. Uh, subsequently, the CMS will be also responsible of the their portion of the subsidy once the individuals are enrolled into this thing. The models that we are seeing being implemented across multiple carriers that or multiple states will be a daily 834s coming. Again, FFE has its own companion guide. Uh, State of Washington has published its own, so does Colorado, so does California. And uh, so every state will have a slightly different version of their uh, 834 enrollment processes. And same thing applies to the obvious of the 820. For instance, um, the in Massachusetts, uh, has actually has a provision uh, that basically enables the consumer to be invoiced by the carrier directly, even though historically uh, Mass Connector has done all the quote unquote premium billing invoicing to the individuals, uh, but going forward, consumer has the option to do so. So what that does mean for a, a carrier in Massachusetts, you now have to build a premium billing system that you will have to reconcile and aggregate payments across coming from the feds. Uh, possibly if you are, uh, if you are one of the, one of your products is a, we call it a state wrap programs. In other words, that state is willing to subsidize portion of it. Then you have a state subsidy portion and then you also have to collect the premium from the individuals. So that's going to require a fairly complex premium billing implementation. Obviously we're not talking about complex matter, things like retroactivity, what happens you know, if I put my children three months ago was born into the plan, how does it affect my bill and going forward basis? Um, there is an interesting topic that's yet to be seen, what's called, also the title as a clawback effect. Clawback effect is basically as an individual initially enrolled into the program under a certain subsidy levels because of their income status and whatnot, but midway through the years, they, their income changes, um, and therefore their subsidy is, is, should have changed, but they failed to report that to, to exchange. So the IRS end of the year may come back, may actually ask for some of the subsidies, if not the all, received. Um, and uh, I don't believe the individuals have that, gonna take that matter lightly, and most likely they will bring that issue with the carrier as a potential friction or conflict point. Um, uh, obviously, the different kind of payment methods we're going to talk about. So your premium billing system has to be not only handling the typical lockbox kind of processing coming from the your 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 existing financial institution you do business with, but you have to also be ready for you know credit card processing and and PayPal's or other types of state based or as well as direct deposit. We know that certain exchanges. Uh, enabling consumers to identify up to three, three direct deposit bank accounts. So, and, and you are responsible of basically consolidating, the carriers are responsible of consolidating and aggregating those payments across three of them. So what happens if, let's say that one of them doesn't have the sufficient funds? What do you do with that situation? How long do you have to wait uh, before you can terminate the individuals? And the termination process obviously has many, many, many uh, caveats associated with it. And each and every one of them, it's going to be a, basically a business process, either defined at the exchange level, at the FFE federal level, or at the state level. So this is an interesting slide, and we'll be happy to discuss in more in depth, perhaps during the Q&A portion of our topic. Uh, some timelines, I think, for everyone to consider. Uh, clearly, the QHP certifications, many states has already started the process. Uh, certain states, as we call it, the active purchaser, like California and Massachusetts, it's requiring a, a basically a certification process. Uh, California, especially being an active purchaser, they believe they will be able to get a better rate 
from the carriers if they can negotiate and select a one or two carriers in a given region. Whereas the other exchanges are a what we call it a clearing house, like Washington, enabling, allowing every plant to basically upload their QHP. As long as they have a certified QHP, they can be part about it. Um, in, in states like Connecticut, they're talking about, again, submitting and accepting non-ACA compliant plan in addition to a, a QHP plans to be enlisted on this thing. This process already started, as you know quite well, that um, there are significant uh, promises or expectations earlier made, whether to use of SURF or HIOS or some other means. Um, uh, interfaces are being now scaled down to Excel spreadsheets. Uh, HIOS has an exciting interface called XML um, that, again, uh, companies like Sophion has a what we call it a plan catalog management that not only consolidates your plan configurations all together into the one single repository, but also can be the source of truth for uh, your QHP certification process. And, and let's not also forget the ongoing SBC requirements. As you know, uh, summary of benefits and coverage was a critical portion of ACA, went into effect as of uh, last September, September 23rd of 2012. So for commercial products you have been doing, uh, SBCs are, will continue to be a critical part of the QHPs as well. So you have to provide an ability to generate a, a, a QH a SBCs uh, within the uh, permissible timelines, I believe up to seven, within seven days. So many of these exchange portals will have the ability to generate SBCs on the fly, like the products that, that we do provide uh, within our, within our P QHP certification or our plan catalog management platform. Uh, individual shop enrollment process is, is something that's going to start very, very shortly. We are already seeing some of the states are going into, quote unquote, their internal uh, testing, uh, testing that, quote unquote, 834 with the respective companion guides between their existing vendors that was in the process of implementing the Higgs portals, um, as well as the, we expect that sometimes around May, June, you are going to be start seeing invitations or timelines about carrier getting a, a test 834 or test 820 streams coming through your way, which then ties into the premium billings. I mean, you need to have a premium billing platform implemented as part of your, as part of your implementations. Otherwise, you know, what would you do with that 820 remittance payments came from three different sources. You need to aggregate those. So we strongly urge you to consider the premium billing systems to be up and ready no later than, no later than probably uh, July, August timeframes to be fully functional September 1st. September 1st is, is go live date. It's not even October 1st for many exchanges. Customer service, again, I think that we're going to see a lot of the questions, again, take into consideration that open enrollment will start October. Uh, then the, you know, people will come back to you uh, with an adding independent. They have a new baby uh, in, in December timeframes and they're going to ask for address change and plan change during that time. Before the before the actual uh, you know the, the 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 coverages are effectuated, you need to have a process to describe and take on these. And by all definitions, that your CSR who's going to be taking your exchange related memberships count, um, they have to be operating at a different level of um, competency than your current uh, CSRs because these systems are sometimes you may not have all the answers. Uh, the parts of the answer will be maybe at the your state exchange portal sites. So for that matter, in fact, the, uh, some of the exchanges, state exchanges are considering building a CSR portals for the carriers to come in and being able to consolidate that, quote unquote, the customer service transactions. Um, that's basically in the post go live, obviously exciting times with the January 1st for everything to happen. So far, we do not see any kind of a delays. Uh, we are seeing uh, the basically what we call the deferments. Uh, deferment in, in, a, in a really the, in, a, in a humorous way, kind of uh, shedding weight so that the the exchanges can take off and be successful. And before anyone asks, uh, I don't believe the January first timeline will move. Uh, there are too much uh, too much uh, attachment for different reasons. Um, and the but I think the success will be a, is has a, always been a relative term. So depending upon the state that you're in, depending upon the what the Fed may uh, announce over the next several weeks, um, 
I think uh, exchanges are here to stay. And that pretty much wraps up our presentation. Uh, I'll skip this uh, agile approach to it. We'll talk perhaps more in the Q&A session. So, uh, Lisa, I will turn over back to you. Okay, thank you. To ask a question via the web presentation, please choose the chat pod located in the lower left corner of your screen. Type your question in and hit the send message button. And we do have one uh, question already queued up. And they ask, could you throw some light on whether Sotheon Exchange Connector provides the ability to manage 3R programs? If not, what are some of the considerations for payers to automate this program? Uh, the short answer is yes. That's that's one of our value propositions to the carriers too, um, especially the three R's as being commonly referred as that. Um, the There are multiple other products and platforms that are going to be obviously being provided to you as it comes down to the, the risk adjustments. And as you know, the, uh, the rating aspect to it, um, the state uh, at the federal level, especially speaking, uh, there's going to be a single risk pool uh, other than the region, which is going to be a function of perhaps a zip code, and the tobacco use, all they are the only two criteria that's going to determine the the quote unquote the the rate information. But we suspect there will be other products out there, uh, more robust rating engines perhaps will come in, as well as the other types of risk mitigation and risk management uh, components available. To okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, would you be able to provide some insight into the premium billing capability for a Softion Exchange Manager, specifically subsidy reconciliation automation with legacy systems? Sure. Um, the, this is, again, a, perhaps a, a, a kind of the approach that we take is is that the uh, the premium billing is, is a critical component of the quote-unquote exchanges. Um, the premium billing platforms that we provide is basically is very well capable of doing the quote unquote aggregation or reconciliation process, uh, taking the various you know uh, two sometimes three different 820 remittance feeds and being able to reconcile those uh, on a timely basis all together. Um, the the what we what we are seeing is basically the carriers in that model. Then what they need to do is in their current existing systems um, they will. Pretty much, uh, they will set up another, you know, government program, pretty much like Medicaid or Medicare Part D Medi type of a program where the, the quote unquote, the shadow invoicing or shadow billing takes place, and the reconciliation between the premium billing that comes within our Exchange Connector platform will then be reconciled against that backend system so that the the respective general ledger transactions will be fully applied. Okay, thank you. And um, just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, just go to that chat pod in the lower left corner, type your question in, and press the send message button. Uh, there are no additional questions at this time, um, but it looks like one may be coming in. Um, no, actually. Um, if I'll turn it back to you, Eugene, if you have any uh, additional comments, and then I'll, I'll let you know if we do have any other questions coming in. Sure. Thank you again, Lisa. Again, uh, we want to thank everyone for taking the time out of your uh, precious and very busy schedules. Uh, we do know that these are the challenging times, if you will, um, but uh, we have seen the financial services, you know, dating back to what I've done about 20 plus years in financial services and other types of banking related in industries. Uh, this 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 process, this kind of a, a kind of a reinvention uh, has already implemented very successfully and led to the you know the the, the birth of an organizations that some of them that uh, Craig has mentioned. It is a disruptive process, it's a disruptive technology, but um, opportunities are well within the reach for organization to really step up and, and take the leadership position. So uh creative concepts, creative ideas, this is a perfect time to really kind of putting those to, into test and uh and we're expecting to see some uh, significant uh, significant innovative ideas and products all the way from things like narrow networks. The carriers are focusing on a particular type of services that are basically establishing their presence. And uh, down the road, what we call the star alliances, uh, meaning that the just as today, you might be able to go to USAIR website and you buy a ticket, but your first leg of your flight could be on an American Airlines. 
So that kind of collaboration, that kind of a partnerships like the Star Alliance partnership at the carrier level will give the consumer the choice what they need, but it will allow the carriers to be kind of quote unquote uh, more proficient and more 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 effective as far as the let it be cost containment or their subject matter valuations or or the or the proposition to the individuals. Um, it's a lot of exciting things are happening. There's every day we're hearing you know some of the carriers about their approaches to you know the getting into the different markets that historically they have been in a Medicaid plan. Now they're kind of deep diving into the individual market as well as we're seeing uh, large hospital systems creating their own little uh, exchanges and creating their little own insurance plans altogether. So one thing is obviously very common is that the change is the only constant thing I think we're going to hear over the next uh, two or three years. And uh, again, there's, uh, there's not much uh, anyone can predict at this time other than the only problem is that change is going to be very disruptive. So I think we all have to kind of buckle our seats and seat belt and, and, and go for this ride. And again, thank you all very much. I don't know if, if we lost Craig. He had another commitment to jump into it. Uh, but I wanted to thank the audience. We, on behalf of Forrester and Sofian, thank you very much for your time. And uh, look forward to, uh, we should be posting this uh, presentation to AHIP website very shortly. And uh, my contact information is available for your convenience. Please do not hesitate to reach out. Okay, thank you, Eugene, for that great presentation and for sharing your thoughts today. Thank you to the audience for participating in today's conference. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day.